Welcome to the Dividend Talk podcast, episode 41. Our Intel, a classic turnaround company. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. I'm your co-host, Engineer My Freedom, and today I'm joined with European DGI. This is a podcast where we discuss our passion for dividend growth investing with our own unique European flavor. If you're new to this channel, please hit the like button and subscribe to us, and check out our previous episodes on YouTube and Spotify. See you on the inside. Hey, we're back. It's another weekend. How are you doing, European DJ? Well, it's weekend, so I feel really great. And uh, again, you know, we have got a really great topic today as well, talking about Intel. It's one of our companies that we actually really like to talk about. So, uh, yeah, you know, there's never a dull moment going on in the world. I mean, stock market was a bit uh, going up and down again, like always. So uh, uh, nothing that really concerns us as long-term investors. So, yeah. Yeah, lots, lot, lots of, lots of crazy stuff going on. The first, the first thing is, is this Suez Canal. What is going on over there? That is crazy, absolutely crazy. What's going yeah, on. you know what I like the most? Evergreen is getting a lot of advertising. Yeah, because the letters on the ship are so big that even on every picture on every website you see Evergreen. So I thought like. Is this like a dividend paying company? So I looked it up and it's from Evergreen um, Marine and I believe it's uh, based in Taiwan. But it's I think it's a private company. It's not listed. Um, hence, I, I cannot buy it because I was really hoping that it would be a, like a dividend aristocrat or, so, <laughs> or something like that because it's all free commercial. Of, of course, you, you type Evergreen into Google right now and it just says joint ship blocking the Suez Canal so I mean it's it's crazy crazy free free advertising from but it, it it shows how important that that little well I say little it's a long but how that how important that canal is it's it, I think someone said 10 billion a day it's worth that it's that it's holding up yeah yeah there are a few numbers going on I I also heard in it 400 million per hour 400 million per hour but did you see the pictures? I mean, like a little tractor <laughs> trying to, to take some scent away from this big tanker. I mean, th this becomes such a story that it will be for weeks, I'm afraid. I mean, yeah. wow. They're, they're talking about two two weeks, aren't they? At least that this could go on. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Oh my god! Imagine being the captain and calling your wife at home, saying like, "Sorry, I will be a few days later because, uh, yeah, check the news." <laughs> I, I I accidentally got stuck. <laughs> if, if you want to know where I really check the news, you will find exactly where. <laughs> but but this has this has impacts, don't it, on Europe and Asia and even energy. Has has yeah. has big impacts on it. So I, I I mean I know there's there's a little a little war going on with China, Europe, and the US at the minute, and this is just going to add fuel to that as well. It's so so like how does a boat that size get stuck? Well, you know, uh, I think uh, it's quite common knowledge that you don't turn a tanker ship uh, that easily, but you know uh, I think. I already heard complot theories that uh, this has been a setup and everything to to take the economy. So let's park that aside. Uh, I I did hear from some uh, companies in, the, in in the news already that they are expecting some supply issues, and this is also really interesting. So now you also get to see which companies are really depending on Chinese imports, right? Yeah. Because that's always a little bit like with some companies they are not so transparent about it. Yeah, because uh, they want to, I don't know, promote local or there's like an anti-Chinese import thinking sometimes, right? Uh, yeah. Because you would compete the local grocery store away. So this all becomes really obvious now in the upcoming weeks as long as this takes. So, yeah, uh, I find it a really interesting story and how a ship can uh, hit the news and disrupt a part of the economy is just 
shows how fragile it is. And I mean, who knows, you know, if you would have been a terrorist and you wanted to disrupt the economy, who would have thought about just, you buy know, a boat. buy a boat? <laughs> 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 yeah. And without it's, uh, killing people, without killing yeah, people, right? Yeah. yeah. It's 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 a safer option. I mean, you only need one captain to be a clown and yeah. <laughs> try and turn turn a bit tank around. Uh, would 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 such this would this size of a ship also be able to block the Panama ca Canal? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, that's interesting to look up. Let's do that after the show. Yeah. But it, it's interesting you mentioned China there and and the impacts on that because it leads into the next the next topic that I saw and that's some of our European retail stocks are in trouble because of issues with, with China. So Adidas, Inditex, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but Phil, do you know Phil, he wrote an actual blog post on them and it's on my blog if you want to check it out. Um, HMM and Nike, the share price is falling because apparently H&M came out and criticized some of the working condition in, in China. Beijing have come out and said, oh, we don't want people giving us a bad name. And they've apparently they went and researched all other companies that have criticized them for this reason, have found these four companies and now are starting to have sanctions on them. But it, it really affects these companies because they are trying to grow and expand in China. So Adidas and Nike, for example, are trying to grow in China. And now the Chinese are kind of going, well, we are not welcome here or trying to kick them out or if they're not going to be if the chinese snub them a little bit that's a huge market share drop for them it, it, it could be a disaster yeah 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 so i generally i prefer my exposure to china to be limited because mm. i don't trust um, um i said their approach to capitalism so I the, I have a small position in Alibaba, Alibaba full disclosure um, as a value play because I among all these tech st stocks I really find it undervalued. But that's again it's probably rightly valued so because of the Chinese influence. But if I think about all the other companies, if the only catalyst that I see is growth in the Chinese market, it will not be a catalyst for me because uh, the dependency then on future growth is too risky for me. Uh, if you look at Unilever, they're growing in the whole of Asia, right? Not, not just China or something like that. So it's an important topic for me from that point of view. Yeah, but you, you can see why companies target China because so many people live there. If you can crack that, it's a huge it's huge potential. But but like you said, there's political downfalls to that that have to be that you have to be aware yeah. of. I think you need to discount that in your, uh, uh, how you say it, in the share price you're willing to pay for a company. If they really have a large exposure to China, I think you need to discount for that and take some money off of your fair value price just for that reason. So I, I, I've got also some news actually, a total different uh, story, but let's go to Germany. Um, because you know these kinds of stories they usually don't really hit the news on twitter or facebook or social media but what i found really interesting is that siemens health veneers and we had a show on siemens a while ago where we analyzed the stock and you know siemens health health veneers is a subsidiary of uh, siemens and they are 79 percent owned um i said by um uh, by by their parent company siemens and the issue of why they were never in the DAX index, uh, because there is too too little float, so too little, too few shares outstanding to be traded in. Okay. And Siemens Health Veneers just um, um, did an acquisition uh, of Varian Medical Systems, which is there, which is a company to 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 support the cancer treatment. And what they did as they got like uh, a loan from the parent company 15 billion or something like that to um, a, a bridge loan but they also now use this opportunity uh, uh, to fund a part of this acquisition to to do a share issue of 2.8 billion and with the share issue there should be um, uh, 53 million shares now um, circulating which might make them I said um, legible to enter the 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 main German index, the duck index, and then yeah. it becomes interesting because then there happens more trading in this company. We get more visibility on it. 
more in the news. And I think this is a good thing, typically, if you get to the main index. So, yeah, for me, this is one of those little things that you see, like, in the side notes of uh, deep in the news. And I felt like, oh, interesting, because this could be uh, uh, good for Siemens again. Yeah, Nice story. You, you, you hold Siemens, so you have some... Um... Shares in it, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's well, I, I don't have Siemens Healthineers. I've got Siemens, and with Siemens, you own Siemens Healthineer because they have a seventy-nine person stake in it. I actually don't know what it means after the share issue. If the if the also the the stake of Siemens and Siemens Healthineers will decrease, I, I'm not aware of that. I, I did see that I think uh, one of the biggest purchases of those shares was a Qatar fund. Because, um, and this is what I don't like, right? They issue those shares only to institutional investors. This is the same what we see with IPOs. Why as retail yeah. investors, we don't get direct access uh, to purchase some shares, right? And that's why I actually like spec deals. Because at least as a, as a I said, the retail investor, you can buy already the spec shares. The only thing is there, you have no clue what you're going to get back for it, right? Um, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so I think that leads nicely then into our main topic. Um, I know we spoke about Intel a couple of episodes, I think it was episode 31, um, when Bob Swan was in charge and, and they had a bit of a disaster. And Our title was a play on, on his words, but we have a little bit of a different sentiment now, I believe. Intel is back, baby, in the words of the new CEO, but I just wanted to get your thoughts, first of all, on their recent webcast so i'm actually you know i don't own intel for the reason um, that i find it a struggling company that lost their com competition so far to amd tsmc and have been in denial so far to hear the ceo speaking this week on intel unleashed uh, really gave me a lot of excitement because what, what, what for me, when you look at the turnaround uh, here, you need to have a an, have an, uh, CEO that attacks the problem at the heart of where the problem resides, is no nonsense, not bullshitting anyone because we're not blind, and comes with a strategic business plan to fix the company. And all of this I have heard in the conference. And what was even more convincing to me is that someone like Sacha Nadella was willing to spend his time to step out from his daily job and to say a few nice words to uh, uh, towards Intel. Yeah. And and uh, because one of the things that they did, we will get soon to that, is that they are launching their Intel Foundry services business unit with their own profit and loss. Effectively, they are going to produce chips for others, uh, um, uh, like based on their uh, needs, uh, particularly. And this is something that Microsoft, Amazon uh, have committed to uh, um, already, uh, uh, spoken their support out for that. So for someone then to, like such an Adela to come on, I think that gives such a powerful message. And also through the, through the whole conference, let's say, I heard all the time local supply, security reasons. Um, there's yeah. this real political thing going on in Europe and, America, where we want to have more um, a domestic supply chain for these kinds of uh, yeah. hyper technology. So for me, the CEO is on top of it. I was amazed by his enthusiasm. I was amazed by his plans, and um, he really got me excited. Uh, I think the I think the shares are not worth their price. Don't don't get me wrong. But if it would be but now back on forty five, where it was what is it a year ago? Yeah, I would strongly consider it seeing these plans because then it's worth waiting. We, we we've spoke about the importance of a CEO, haven't we, before? And and we had a little chat off air and listening to the webcast. And when Pat spoke, it was so engaging. You were, I mean, you were involved. You were listening to every word. And then he turned over to Arvid Kishner of IBM, and it was <laughs> it, it, it was it was like a it was like a switch. And I've said this to you. It was it was like a yeah. switch. It was like subconsciously i switched off i i have no clue what Albert said and he was just talking 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 it was going over my head and then pat comes back on all of a sudden engaged yeah. and i i think and you said it you said it if if a ceo can't if a ceo can't 
give me enthusiasm? How is he going to give his and his staff or his employees enthusiasm? And certainly from Pat, you you get that sense of action. I'm here yeah. to do a job. I'm here to turn this around. Now, he's only been in that job one month. Do you be, really believe that these are all his ideas or were they already there? But I don't think Bob Swan would have got away with coming out with, with this. So, uh, so I've got a few thoughts on that. First of all, then Bob Swan should have shared those ideas. Yeah, I think it might have been the lack of ideas uh here it might be that the people around him had all these ideas but often you have groupthink yeah if you think really about how management teams are working there's all these psychological aspects there from the other side maybe he was already um uh, targeted uh, i mean i'm speculating here maybe he was already uh, uh ringed up a few times before let's say are you interested in this job we might sack the other guy um but you know from the other side i think this guy is an industry veteran yeah, he, he knows his stuff. He knows what's needed. He knows how the market looks like. I mean, you probably also know from your business, if there are three, four things that you would do different, you can put them quickly on an A, A, A4 page. And yeah. then uh, in one month, you, 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 you take the best, brightest minds around you in, in this energy that is being unleashed and, and, and you get to a plan like this, right? So um for me this just looks promising and now it comes down to for me and we will we still need to go i think a little bit through what he's actually promising but it comes yeah. down to is now his leadership skills is he able to select the right people that can execute for him because being a person that have has good ideas doesn't mean that they are also a good executor yeah yeah and this is really where 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 it comes down to now can he really find the right executives around him that can really execute on these plans Yes, yeah, so we, we might dig then a little deeper in into what he's actually what he's actually planning to do. And I suppose the first one is this 20 billion investment into new fabs in, in Arizona. I mean I, I find this I, I think it's I think it's really good timing, to be fair. I know I've I've mentioned before this Chips for America Act. I mean, and you touched on it. America and Europe to a certain extent are worried about the supply chains they are completely worried and and they are right because you've got tmc who are taiwan based samsung are europe based so it's not too much of an issue for europe but for americans they don't really have anyone at the moment so they need to shore that up because there is a shortage and it doesn't look like it's going to be i mean strengthened anytime soon yeah yeah and then you know you've got i mean there are so many industries tailwinds right like uh, all the chips required in these in, the, in these cars and everything and i mean i'm not even the industry expert right but it's just so obvious right everything's being chipped nowadays yeah so i think and what what is also is a security issue just think about 5g and all the all the uh with trump and and not willing to have what's this Huawei? i think it was to produce wow. 5g yeah exactly all this stuff <laughs> all this stuff in the states so i think there is this really this this security thing and i don't i don't know i mean we're not in all these secret agencies we don't know what's going on right so and, uh, it's not like i trust my my governments also too much uh, from that point of view but let's assume that that's all true that's another big tailwind for a company like intel and intel in that case has a good it's an iconic company so they still have some goodwill right so um, I find it also smart that they are um, going to to build these factories and also use it for their foundry services because, look, this is this comes down to the quote: "If you can beat them, join them," and that's what they are doing now. And uh, they are now they can become the preferred suppliers for Microsoft and um, I said and Amazon. Uh, yep. The issue is that they have the power in the supply chain, not Intel. That's a big issue. At the, at, at the same time, Intel gets to learn a lot again about what their needs are, can use that to create their own IP and, and bring the next chips in, yeah? Because they're going to co-design all this stuff. So on the short term, it might might give, might shift the power more from Intel to 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 the, uh, the clients in the supply chain. But that yeah. power has already shifted because Intel is not in the game at the moment uh, when it comes to that anyway, so... Yeah. It it may it makes complete sense that that they do this. I got the feeling from 
before that they weren't going to do it as much. I know they were going to outsource a little bit, but it was a lot more than, than I expected. But I feel like they are so far behind, they need to do this. And I believe like the, in their seven nanometer, they're going to have a, like a, a dual package with TMC. So there's, and it's the first time in their history that they have to rely on, on someone from the outside for their GPUs and CPUs. And in, by 2023, it'll be a dual package with them. So they, look, there'll be a loss of margins, but like you, I think it's required to get them back on par with these companies that have, have overtaken them. And there's no doubt that they have overtaken them. They're robbing market share from them. They, they have the technology. But if they if they can start on, on a level field again and bring them back, I mean, they have the cash flow. They have the cash flow yeah. to, to really yeah. invest and to, and to propel again. Yeah, and this is the difference between AT&T and uh, Intel. Intel has so much more cash flow and less debt burden that they are more flexible in their finances to make these kinds of investments. Yeah. So for me, it's uh, it's really hopeful. Um, it's giving just a lot of hope, and I think that's usually the first wave in the turnarounds. And I'm, I'm yeah. Also, also when we look at um, I said their. Um, uh, because we're talking, when you were talking about outsourcing, you're talking also about this IDM 2.0, what they're talking about. But their own foundry services to be, let's say, an outsource provider yes. towards Amazon and Microsoft. So they're really taking it now from both sides. And I find it really smart. And 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 yeah, I, I, just, I, I just find it really smart because, like I just mentioned, they will get to learn so much from this. And also, they get to embed more into their ecosystems there, and 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 also into the also further, I think, in the data centers and and the AI yeah. related to it. If you think, if you so, and this is so nice about such a vision, right? You can start dreaming a bit here. So, do you think, for instance, then, if they really go into the data center space where there are a lot of AI investments, whether they also could could at a certain moment, um, um, I said get to a capacity of what nvidia is offering now yeah, yeah i mean there's there's no reason why they can't in in my opinion there's no reason why they can't and one interesting question that came up on the webcast and it was the very first question was they've tried this foundry service before they've tried yeah. and it failed why is it different this time and i was so impressed with pat's response to that and i mean there's no there's no but look he's an engineer we're we're both engineers of sorts and there's no bullshit. He just cut straight to the point. It just wasn't a good time or a good business model at the time. Now is the right time. It's different, different market conditions. It is the right time. And I agree with him. Yeah. So I think the, I, I think, look, the whole story is really, really a good story. And I think it's a start of a turnaround that that's what it can still fail in many ways because if they're not living up you know i mean they have now such an adela and then and, and this clown from ibm uh, uh committing to to intel live but if they screw this up poof that 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 could be really bad but i cannot imagine that this pet will let this being screwed up no i, I can't cannot see imagine i can't see it so but we have to be careful as well because I know after hours the price was up seven eight percent based on I mean it, it's good news euphoria yeah, euphoria it, it's yeah. good news but nothing has actually happened and Pat has said it himself he, he it's he put it into his into his speech it's not a throwaway comment but he said twenty twenty one is a transitional year so it's not going to happen overnight it's not going to happen this year we might start seeing the benefit of it towards the end of next year, quarter four, 2022. This yeah. is the earliest I'd expect to see something. So I think it's, even though it's the start of a turnaround or hopefully the start of a turnaround, there's still time to sit back and wait. Yeah. And, may, and, so to, the, see, yeah. and to see this turnaround actually happening. Yeah, and now I come in as a dividend investor. I don't mind waiting during a turnaround but then it needs to have a four percent yield or something like that yeah a decent yield that you get compensated for it and we're not getting compensated at these prices enough uh, so for me it's therefore not attractive at this price 
But again, if something happens and it drops to 50, 45, and not because they have executional issues, but because of a market crash, yeah. that's when I might uh, dip my toes in, uh, in, in, into Intel because then it's worth the waiting. I, I have a slight confession to make. I, I, go. I, I sold I sold my shares of Intel. I sold it at, <laughs> at $67. $67. And, and, and people might be surprised. And, and this all actually came around from a discussion we had in the group. And it's an actual Dutch investor. Um, D, DKK was on. And he was thinking about selling it. And his rationale made sense. I know I, I, know I was arguing against him. But then the more I thought about it, 67 i think their all-time high is like 70 dollars and that was back in 2000 right before when the last bubble happened and they were close to that now and, and i don't see them growing past that in the next year or two i really don't i, I think that's their ceiling I, I i could be wrong i i'm only starting to learn technical analysis but i, I could be wrong on that so i sold them I, I took a really nice profit from them i bought them at 45 is my average so i took a nice profit from them but I am selling puts on them now. So I, I do want to buy them back. So I have puts set at a lower price and just buying that premium and then averaging down my, my price even more. Wondering if this will be one of your lessons learned in a future blog post a year from now that you should have never sold them. It it it, it could be. It, it could be. And I actually said it to my wife when I was there. Will will I will I tell him? Will I tell him I sold him? I said, I have to, I have to be honest. But yeah, I mean it. It does venture on the side of trying to time the market, doesn't it? It's 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 yeah. very close, but I think I have rationale behind it that I'm confident that it doesn't. But if if it does, it does. Yeah. So I would never sell a high quality company like Microsoft, which is a winner. Yeah. Although you could argue it's uh, highly valued. But this is not a high quality company from that point of view. It's a broken company trying yeah. to turn around. Yeah, I, I, I would never sell a tier one and I would be very, very hesitant to sell tier two. But yeah. I had in, Intel along with Cisco. They are like tier three companies at best for me. So I, yeah. I'm more than happy to take that gamble. And look, I can I can gobble up some premium while I'm while I'm waiting for the price to come down anyway. Yeah. And then um, maybe the last thought about Intel, if they're investing 20 billion and also in the new equipment, and I think the Kleine Capitalist also brought it up in the group. There's really one one company benefiting from this, and this is the Dutch ASML. Yeah, yeah. so they can really expect some big orders there. And he was uh, referring to it, right? But in one of his first sentences, he was already talking about EUV and uh, uh, yeah. uh, ASML. So I think if you are more also into growth companies, check out ASML. Um, I have no clue about their valuation or something like that. But if we're talking about one of the top-notch companies in the chip industry, chip, then, then it's ASML because they're uh, selling all those high-end machines that the companies like Intel and such need to produce their uh, uh, chips. So, yeah. And I, and I believe the equipment is expensive. <laughs> uh, it's really valuable. That's what you mean. Exactly. And price is what you pay. Value is what you get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a better chance to work, better chance to work. But but certainly, uh, I mean, it's nice to see you a little bit more bullish on Intel. I, I'm still, I'm still a bull on them. I, I I I like the company, and I love this CEO, and I think that's the the main driver now. And just, I really hope he delivers. I'm I'm hoping, yeah. I'm hoping that he does. Yeah, my, my narrative has changed with this um, uh, on the company because with the old CEO, it was literally for me like uh, in denial. Um, well, well, it was plain obvious. So I felt like, okay, I'm not going to touch such a company. Uh, it's an iconic br brand, but it sounded more like dead money and only declining money like the next IBM. Mm. But um, I think they have found a really talented CEO. And this, this but you know, it is like that new strategy. It changes the narrative and the narrative is important when you buy a company because we learn from all the great investors if you cannot cannot tell in one sentence why you own a company you better not have it yeah, yeah. and and i start to be able to formulate a sentence now for intel just not at this price yeah <laughs> <laughs> a, a sentence with a condition
Yeah, with a condition. Yeah, but that applies to everything, right? Everything can be expensive. Uh, yeah. And 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 what do you think of their new research collaboration with IBM? I know you're a huge fan of IBM. Um, I, I think there will nothing come out of it because IBM is a declining business. So, I mean, yeah, expect declining uh, revenue on that account. I mean, what are they going to do? Are they going to um, uh, produce... Uh, floppies or how do you call them floppy disks uh, for the old ibm mainframes now is that what the founder services are going to do <laughs> I, I i was expecting a rant but i'm, I'm really laughing at, at the show notes here <laughs> what you have wrote down it's <laughs> i wish I what wish did i write down <laughs> <laughs> nodding sensible came out of our Krishna's mouth blah 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that was to your point uh, so maybe to the listeners i played his his two minutes i played it four times back to understand what this and i sorry i need to call the clown by now what <laughs> what he was saying four times nothing sensible came out it was corporate jargon blah 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 it, it totally had no meaning what he was saying I mean, how I I I get tired all almost already thinking about this 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 company, but yeah, that's it. So don't expect anything from this uh, research collaboration. Really, <laughs> if there comes something out of it, then uh, I mean, then uh, it's like the same as uh, winning the lottery or or that someone gets cured from cancer by going to the church. I mean. That's kind of on the same level here. Hey, who, who knows? Time, time will tell. Time will tell. Through that. <laughs> okay, I think. I think. Um, I mean, let let's go to the listeners' questions. It was a great topic to have because many people think about this with turnarounds, and for me, this is really the first moment that I think like, yeah, Intel can turn around. So, yeah. And and if you listen back, I think it was. I think it was 10 episodes ago we, we spoke about them and we had a little bit of a different tone on oh, Intel. I, I, I was a little bit more optimistic than you are, but this was before Pat was announced, I think. Um, and it was a different tone and it's it's amazing. It's only two, two and a half months since and we, we have a complete different outlook. So it's it's always worth keeping an open, open mind and, and seeing what's happening with companies. Definitely. Okay, we'll jump in then. We'll jump into the listeners' questions. And the first one is from none other than Phil. And he asked us, he said, there seems to be a lot of supply chain issues happening right now. Um, he named some companies. Um, is this something you take into account for this year's strategy, or do you see it as a short-term issue only? Um, I see it as a sort short-term issue issue and for instance i'm not invested in um, um in i'm not heavily invested in companies that rely on, on on these events like what happened in texas with the electrical grid or the semiconductor industry so for me it's really not an issue maybe for the oil companies that i have but no i mean these are nothing fundamental they will quickly these are rather blips on the radar and they will disappear in the footnotes of uh, or in the justification when someone had a bad quarter, they will put all the blame on that. But then exactly. we also know that they are fooling us. So no, I don't take this too serious. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, um, so we have next question from Centrino and he's asking with a lot of dividend stocks overvalued due to price appreciation, wouldn't it be smart to sell a portion of your shares? And with that money, buy undervalued stocks, uh, so that you get a higher dividend yield in, in return. So what? What? The, and I have this thought as well, often, right? Like, what if I would sell so sell Microsoft now for let's say less than one person yield and buy a company with four person yield back? Yeah, you really up up your dividend income straight away. So that's effectively the question here. Yeah, and and I've just sold Intel for that kind of reason that the price has appreciated to a point where I don't see it going too much further and it makes sense to pull back. Um, I bought some Unilever with, with that money and I have money then for, for selling puts on it. I mean, it, it does, it does make sense in, in a literal sense when you, when you look at it in writing like that, 
it does make sense to sell companies that has appreciated value to a point where you don't see it appreciating much longer and buy under value. But the problem comes, one, you're, you're risking time in the market, and two, if it's a top quality company, why why would you want to sell them to buy another company? I I mean I only want to, I'd only think about it as I said my tier three or tier four I'd never do it with Johnson Johnson or Abbey V or Microsoft any of those companies with with Intel it's a little bit different it's same with Shell but if it's a top quality company then I wouldn't consider it only only with those that are good companies. I've got the exact same philosophy. Generally, I never sell some a company for that reason. But if a tier four company suddenly quadruples, let's say, and uh, I don't, I I totally don't understand it, and it is so low yielding, I will probably put it into another undervalued company, indeed. But yeah, yeah, not not yeah. not for my not for my foundational stocks, definitely not. Yeah, but I can I can see I can see the merit in such a such a strategy, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, um, Dividend Wave asked us for a feedback on Intel, and I we, we did we did a show on that, so I don't think we have to answer this question. Mm -hmm. And the next one is from Tiago Diaz, and he said the upcoming Unilever annual annual general meeting is coming, and there's 26 resolutions to be voted on. Have you considered how you're going to vote? Which items will you reject? And he's not liking item 20 that renews the authority to directors to issue shares. Yeah. So I had no time before the show to look into it. But so I need to take it as the sentence literally um, uh, mentions it, that we are giving the directors um, the right to issue sh new shares. This is always a really difficult question um, uh, for two reasons. And, and this is so I don't know the justification why they ask for this permission, right? To issue shares. But if it's issuing shares to be able to do acquisitions, large acquisitions, bold on acquisitions, which need to happen quick and in secrecy, I, I, I would support it. But then I would like to know what the strategic plan is that they're after, yeah, before accepting it um if it's like even without a justification just to issue shares i would not do it because i think that's the role of the shareholder to protect our shares our principal uh and we don't want to give necessary dilution because you know that's the whole whole capitalistic system right you have a board of directors they work for the shareholders yeah and we don't it's not like the shareholders work for the board of directors so I believe the shareholders should decide about what happens to their shares, and that includes dilution and such. However, under given circumstances, if you have a good strategy, which is about expanding revenue due to targeted acquisitions, and you agree with that, that share issuing is a cheap form of financing, I'm for it. And then you put the cap on it. You say, OK, you can only do, I don't know, issue up to 10 percent of shares or something like that yeah but but i would never hand uh, a ceo a blank check um unle unless it's the founder and he's proven over 30 years or something like that but that's not the case here in uh, unilever so i'm i'm with the chago on this one that generally i don't like it uh, such okay. things okay and we have another question from the nl which I assume is Netherlands dividend investor. Mm -hmm. And he asked us, do you have a strategy or rule to buy solid companies that are always looking overvalued? So Visa or MasterCard, for example. Uh, no, I don't buy them if they are overvalued. I'm, I'm a combination of a value investor and dividend investor. You know what it is with some of those companies? They look overvalued because we're in the longest bull market ever, where sometimes like common sense has uh, disappeared yeah to 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 buy nike at these prices what is the multiple of 40 or 50 for the sneakers that they are selling it's insane it's literally insane and then with the political risk on it with china and such so no the, the only thing um that i could do and then i'm looking at visa here is to do something similar what i have done with microsoft 
or what I what I sometimes recommend that okay buy Microsoft together with a high yield so that you still have an average yield of two or three percent right and so that you mix some growth into your portfolio which I think is not bad uh, to have some future growth but then you need to consider that it will only have a meaningful impact to 15 20 years down the line and for, it depends then on how far you are away from your let's say early retirement date and you need to take all these kinds of things in consideration if you do it and that also means that you need to take into consideration can visa for instance still triple or quadruple their market cap based on 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 the size of the market that you see in front of them and when i think about visa i know many people are bullish on it but then i also see revolut and, and such and then i think like hmm um there are some fintech companies and how 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 safe is visa compared to the fintech players uh coming up i think visa is still large enough with the technology and everything it's really a, just the number one in the world but um yeah i feel much more comfortable comfortable than to to do that for instance with microsoft to to add some microsoft together with high yield there okay uh, how do yeah, you look at that I, I I don't have a particular strategy in place. I, I I know you've mentioned before buying a high and and low yield. I mean, I'm not too concerned about that. I, I don't mind a lower starting yield because my retirement date is. I'm not going to be sixty for another twenty years, so I have that time to to let it compound. It just depends on the stage that that you're at. If you're willing, as you said, if you're willing to hold them for twenty years, then then buy them, by by all means. But they are a long they are a long term investment and that's what they have to be seen as yeah exactly and 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 still i do believe that valuation matters i i find it hard to to buy a company that's 35 pe or, or like crazy yeah. i i I, find, I struggle i really struggle to do Me that too. because it's it's clearly overvalued clearly overvalued yeah. and yeah it's just it doesn't it just doesn't sit well with me yeah okay and then we have dr p he is asking um which sectors seem to be undervalued the most right now uh, he's talking about insurance companies as an example but are there also other sectors that are worth screening for undervalued stocks um i i don't i don't screen by sector so i'm not too sure we did speak about insurance companies and the opportunity there at the moment energy is probably still a little bit undervalued it's it's recovering but it's probably still undervalued and i'm not too sure the rest of it, I, I don't know about materials or, or industrials but i i don't hold a lot of them i'm i'm, I'm more healthcare uh, it and consumer staples which are certainly not certainly not undervalued at the moment yeah although i believe that in consumer staples if you don't look at america but more at europe you will still co find quite some good companies that not too high prices like like what you just earlier mentioned unilever alda has there are really some good companies hmm. uh in the consumer staple sector yeah, yeah. but but europe as, as a whole is i mean i think the average is 16 pe which is a yeah. lot lower than than america so european yeah. companies as a whole are are cheaper um yeah. well look like they're cheaper than american stocks at the moment yeah okay the next question comes from Joe, and he asks, "What's your favorite UK stocks?" Um, so s some of uh, my favorites would be um, Diageo. I know we we did a podcast on them that wasn't so bullish in terms of their numbers, but they've got great brand power. I still think they're overvalued at, at the current price. I was I was looking at them recently. I still think they need to come down a bit, but I think they're a great company, great brand power. Um, and I'm worth keeping an eye on. In terms of dividend companies, Aviva is another good one. Um, I know that they are selling their Polish branch actually to Al Alliance as well, which is interesting. But they're they're a good English company, and Vodafone would be another dividend company that I like. Vodafone as well, because they did yeah. a major dividend cut a few years ago, right? yeah they, they did but uh i mean they're still a major a major player I, I i haven't looked into them in in too much detail but 
they yeah. I, I looked into Orange. I don't know if you've heard of Orange. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I looked into them and, and Vodafone. I would rather Vodafone than Orange, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. So um, for me, it's uh, definitely Giaggio, but also, again, it's um, way uh, too expensive. But then I also like Halma PLC, and it's number fourth in the, um, I said, in the um, Noble 30, 30 index. And and it's, uh, I don't know if you know Halma, but it's um, it's kind of, I don't know if I can say it like that, but it's a holding company, kind of the Berkshire Hathaway of uh, of the UK. And it it, uh, it owns several companies that are specialized in, in safety gears and, and, and safety pro products um, uh, and such. And I like that company a lot. Uh, this is so pricey, but I once did a back test, and I believe 10k invested like 10 years ago. I think it really, really had a high uh, growth rate. Um, so Halma is for me definitely something a company that I could recommend. But again, valuation matters. Um, so I also uh, I'm not buying this company, but I would love to own it at a certain uh, certain moment in time. Cool. I, I've actually never never heard of those companies, so I, I might look them up. Is there any others that you like? Uh, from the UK? No, mm. not. <laughs> Sorry, but not not too much. <laughs> I, I did an analysis the other time also on Sage uh, PLC, which gives this what is it, finance software. Yeah, and it was a bit uh, blah. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 doing its job. It's like SAP. But um, um, it's yeah, I mean it's not Salesforce. Yeah, I guess yeah. that's my issue with them. Uh, okay, I, I I quite like Sage. I, I use them um, quite a bit, so I think they have good software. But I I get where you come from. They they certainly aren't Salesforce. Yeah. Okay. Um, then we have Image Invest asked us a question. He said, "If you could only pick one dividend stock to sit on for twenty five years." What would it be? Yeah, and this is really uh, it's a really clever question as well, right? Because it would be the same like if you could close down the stock market for 25 years, your your thinking really started to change. So when I saw this question coming and I first started to talk about think about sectors, I thought like, well, Johnson Johnson is of course natural. But then I think they have a pharma business. Are the pharma prices really sustainable in the US where they get a lot of revenue? I thought like mm, maybe pharma sector, maybe, maybe not. Although if you think about biotech and the possibility maybe that we once will cure cancer, then I think, hmm, but will Johnson Johnson be the one that's curing cancer? I felt like, nah. <laughs> So I think um, I will probably stick to a consumer staple and then I will just choose my uh, favorite like Unilever. But it also could be, uh, for instance, Walmart. Um, although it's not in my, uh, I said, my, my tier one, I'm thinking about 25 years from now, if I see what they're doing with their online business as well, I don't see Walmart going away at all. So, yeah. That's that's some good good reasoning, right there. Um, I know on, on Twitter when this was asked, somebody uh, the Sunday investor actually suggested Coca Cola, which would be a no considering I just sold them. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it be it would be someone like Microsoft. It would definitely be somebody in my my tier one, um, and I don't see Microsoft going anywhere in the next twenty five yeah, years. I mean, they're, they're at the forefront. But even outside of that, if it wasn't a dividend company. And I had one company. It might be Google. I mean, I, they're going. They're who's going to overtake Google in the next twenty-five years? That depends a lot on how we are um, consuming information and how we are looking for information. And no, I wouldn't have the same confidence in Google. I know no. it's a powerhouse, but I find that their investments that they are doing, besides. Uh, the acquisition of YouTube, I think they've gone nowhere. I mean, look at Tesla versus Waymo and, and the amount of kilometers they already have done, uh, Tesla, with self-driving. Um, look, the advertising, they, 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 they failed also on social media, right, with their Google+. Plus. 
Um, they're burning a lot of cash for that. I think they're now getting into the cloud, but I wouldn't know. If I think about one of those companies, I think about Amazon. Amazon is getting so deeply integrated in, in all these supply chains. Then uh, that, but I think when you, so what Google really has is a search engine that is really popular. There's a cash cow plus YouTube. And then you really depend on how we consume information in 10 years from now, because if we shift to virtual reality or something like that, yeah, then then I think YouTube might uh, fall away if YouTube is not able to um, uh, pivot. So then the only question is like, is Google search engine so special, so special that it couldn't be disrupted by someone else? And that question I cannot really answer yet. But I have some doubts there. I think it's possible by a company like Amazon or something like that. So, okay. Well, you know, Microsoft can't do it. They've tried with Bing, and it's awful. Yeah, yeah, because it's. But that has not to do with, I think, with the technology. It has to do that it's a winner takes all market. Yeah, if you if you are used to Google uh, with the Google search. Um, if if you got ninety nine percent of ninety six percent of the world traffic, it's really hard to build up your index, right? Because that's what Bing is about building up an index, and you learn by the amount of people using your yeah. your algorithm. Uh, yeah, but I mean, if if I'm looking for something and I could type the same thing into both search engines, I'll get what I want on Google, and I don't always yeah. get what I want on Bing. Okay, but what if we sh we all shift now to um, augmented reality or something like that, or having a Hololens? I mean, Google needs to be there, right? You need to be able to plug in Google then to search, and if someone else is able to do something there, and suddenly everyone shifts the platform from from a web interface to something else, and Google is not able to pivot with that, then there will be just the next uh, uh, search engine. So. Anyway, uh, this is my opinion, of course. I'm not a specialist uh, from that point of view, but I find Google too much of a one-trick pony compared to a diversified company like Microsoft or Amazon. Okay. Cool. That was a good question. Um, we also had a question from, uh, I think it's Odysseus, and he yeah. asked us, what is the best and worst investor relation department site you've come across so far? So the best is Berkshire Hathaway. It's simple, straight to the point. And also the information in their uh, reports is really good. I mean, from a user friendliness, I think from the large size companies is definitely Procter & Gamble, which is awful, really awful. But there are also like companies, I mean, in France, they. I'm sorry if we're France uh, listeners from France, but I mean, what the heck? Uh, I was the other time, was it? I don't know if it was Solvay or Sodexo, one of those two. I mean, uh, half of the website was just broken. <laughs> so I thought, like, okay, then just put just a phone number on there. That people call you because there was no added value out of the whole investor relations <laughs> website anyway. I mean, it, it's yeah. funny you mentioned mention French companies because my one is a French company. It's, it's Orange SA. I mean, it's <laughs> horrible. <laughs> But I found that too. I found broken links. I felt like emailing them saying, fix this goddamn link. <laughs> I want to I want to get to this particular site. But it, it also felt like I was back in the 1980s. Like the site was just so cumbersome. I mean, yeah. uh, it, was, it was horrible. And they have all their annual report. Like, I just want to download it. That's it. I yeah. just wanted a PDF. They have it in this stupid player that you have to yeah. scroll, scroll through. You can't easily search. It's just a I, I hate this when investor relations websites push you to go through and Microsoft does this as well, right? You need to go into Excel or, or, or into Word to read the annual report. Think about us, please. We just want a bloody PDF, read it on our iPad. Yeah, yeah? but now from Microsoft point of view, it's their product. So I understand that. They want you to, like, you're investing in them. Use that goddamn product, okay? I get it. But everybody else Give it to me in a PDF, please. That's all I want. That's not too hard to ask. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then the last question of the day, and we, we might as well finish up with a rant, but what do you think of IBM? Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> it's from Michelle Christiansen. Uh, I, I, okay, I, 
I believe people yeah. are just are probing you now. They just know you want to rant. Just let it out. No, but I, I can tell you what I would do with IBM. I would sell the consultancy branch. I would spin it off probably as a new entity. Um, I would give the CEO as a package deal together with the uh, managed outsourcing, uh, managed services business unit that they are spinning off. Mm -hmm. I think he fits perfectly in there to to solve L2 and uh, level one and level two tickets. I mean, that's what he, th I think that's what gets him excited. And I would sell Watson and, and Red Hat to Microsoft. I think it will flourish under a company like Microsoft. And then, you know, what's left of the company, I would put it on Etsy or on eBay, depending on where you think the, the most clients are. That's what I would do with IDM, IBM, and that's what I think about IBM. And I would never put my money in this company until there's a proper CEO with knowledge that can turn this company around. It's now a declining, dying business. That's my thinking. I, I'm starting to write a blog post on them, analyzing them. Uh, I started, I think it's 10 days ago now. And man, they've got so many products and it, it, it's like they don't know what they're good at. So they've gone into so many segments and sectors and products and services until they find something that sticks. That's that's what it feels like when I'm, when I'm going through it. It's just, it's like I've spent nearly the bones of 10 days going through that. And that's without even looking at numbers, just, just going through that and trying to digest it in a way. And I think I've, I've got an eye now and just refer people to the 10K and, and pointed out the page number because I mean it's 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 crazy, um, but I'm I'm still going in with an open mind. I mean I still have to take into consideration. Okay, they're splitting their company. How is that going to look, and what their figures will look like when we discount the legacy? Nobody business. knows because they are not transparent about it. Mm. Well, uh, I, I let I let you know when I I dig deeper. Well, but the fact that you already need to dig deeper says already enough about their transparency. Yeah, it's 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 tough, and and like even when you're trying to analyze them on a a segment basis, like they've changed their segment and how they report it in 2016, and now they've changed it again, and it's just hard to make a comparison over over a long period. But of course, the smoke and mirrors. I mm -hmm. mean, I I really don't trust this management. Um, it's poison. Uh, what what's in this management board there? Uh, we, we did the other time in the show on the podcast here where we showed how their EPS was declining continuously, how they were having a bet on what was it. First, it was Watson. Then it was uh, blockchain. The cloud, blockchain, the cloud. I mean, they. it's like, yeah, like you divorce from your wife every year and choose a new one and you say, this is the one. Yeah. yeah? No, it isn't. Anyway, uh, <laughs> good luck with the analysis. I'm really looking forward to read it. And um, I will try to read it with an open mind. Although that's really hard for me. <laughs> Don't lie to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that concludes the show. Um, it's been really fun. I, I, I enjoy talking about Intel. It's a company I, I really like. The questions were great. Um, had us even debating against each other, which is, which is always good. And it's good to get other opinions. Um, as always, we, we've got a ton of emails recently our emails are always open we're on youtube we're on spotify we're on twitter contact us anywhere we'll always write back as, as fast as we possibly can appreciate every every comment and, and every listen so thank you and thanks a million for tonight's show european dj thank you well thank you as well emf and uh, have a lovely weekend adios